Thomson's atomic model and experiments were constructed using Dalton's previous theories. Dalton, having taken an interest in gases, was able to determine the law of partial pressures, stating that the total mixture of gases amounted to the sum of partial pressures that each individual gas exerted while occupying the same space. Even though this law proves useful majorly only in ideal gases, the concept unlocked many other principles of physics and chemistry that would later lead him to conclude that elements combine in ratios to form compounds and aid in the formation of his atomic theory. Dalton's atomic theory consists of four main accepted components. The first is that all matter is made up of atoms that are indivisible and indestructible. The second component is that all atoms of a given element are identical in the properties they hold and identical in their mass. This means that two carbon atoms, for example, would have the exact same mass and have the exact same properties. The third is that compounds are formed by a combination of two or more different kinds of atoms. This, for example, would be carbon and oxygen coming together to form a compound of carbon dioxide. The last accepted component is that a chemical reaction occurs when atoms are rearranged. Dalton's atomic theory, although still accepted as a basic for the atomic model, proved to contain flaws. The first component of Dalton's atomic theory was later proved inaccurate. With our current knowledge in science, we know that atoms can be divided and destroyed with the use of nuclear fission. Dalton assumed that the simplest compound of two elements had to be binary and form from atoms in a simple one-to-one -one ratio. This, for example, led him to the inaccurate assumption that oxygen had an atomic mass of seven and not nine. Dalton possessed no knowledge of electrons, nuclei, or the possibility of isotopes, and obtained very little experimental evidence to prove his theories. His model was created based on experimental procedure conducted macroscopically. This would yield observations that could be observed with the unaided eye, and thus Dalton's atomic model consisted of just the atom itself in the shape of a sphere. Scientists during the 19th century were curious about the properties of a cathode ray. Jean Perrin constructed an apparatus made of a hollow aluminum cylinder that was open at both ends. Using an electroscope, he determined that the charge of the cathode rays were negative. J.J. Thompson revised the cathode ray tube experiment by adding in several factors. Firstly, he made sure that it had a very low pressure and restricted the amount of air within the apparatus. As well, he added in an electric field by adding in positively and negatively charged plates. Lastly, he applied a magnetic field through placing a magnet around the cathode ray tube. No one before could deflect the negatively charged cathode ray, even though the scientists knew from Faraday that magnetic and electric fields could deflect electrically charged particles. He hypothesized that the cathode ray ionized the air, shielding it from the electric fields. In Thomson's first experiment, he wanted to see if he could separate the negative charge out of the rays, as he knew that electrically charged objects could be deflected by magnets. Thomson set up the cathode ray so that a magnet was surrounding it, creating an electric field that the cathode ray would pass through. He found that the rays were bent and the negative charge was bent exactly the same. Thomson's second experiment tested whether the rays would bend in the presence of an electric field, which is what was expected for a charged particle. Normally, without the presence of an electric or magnetic field, the ray beam would travel in a straight line. However, he found the rays bent towards the positively charged plate when an electric field was added. This is the opposite way the ray bent in his first experiment. This is important as it shows that the rays are not the same as a beam of light, as light is not bent by electric or magnetic fields. In his third experiment, Thompson wanted to see if he could measure the mass to charge ratio, that is, the amount of mass relative to the proportional amount of charge. To do this, he measured how far the ray was deflected by a magnetic field to get its velocity. He found that the mass to charge ratio was over a thousand times lower than that of a hydrogen ion, suggesting either that the particles were either very light or very highly charged. In his further examination of the mass to charge ratio, 
Thompson needed to calculate the velocity at which the electron was traveling. This posed as a problem, seeing as how he did not know the mass of the electrons or their charge. However, he found the electron's velocity using his previous knowledge of physics. He knew that the electric force experienced by the electron was equal to the charge of the electron multiplied by the electric field. He also knew that the magnetic force was equal to the charge of the electron multiplied by its velocity and the magnitude of the magnetic field B. The net force experienced by the electron then was the electric force added to the magnetic force. Since magnetic and electric fields are perpendicular to each other, the net force acting on the charged particle is equal to zero. Thus, the electric force is equal to the magnetic force. The charge on both sides cancels out and we are left with the electric field strength is equal to the magnitude of the magnetic field multiplied by the velocity. If the equation is isolated for velocity, we end up with a final equation of velocity equaling the electric field over the magnitude of the magnetic field. From the results obtained, Thompson concluded the following. First, cathode ray particles are all identical. Second, these particles are common to all matter. And third, these particles are negatively charged. The last point was a huge advance in the knowledge of chemistry and physics, as before this time, it was believed that there was nothing smaller than the atom. With Thomson's experiments, he proved that electrons existed, which were smaller than atoms and negatively charged. The most profound part of Thomson's experiments was his calculation of the charge to mass ratio of the electron. In this experiment, the magnetic field was constant as well as its velocity. Because of this, centripetal motion comes into play. The net force is equal to the magnetic force experienced by the electron, as well as the centripetal force. When we sub in the components of the centripetal force and the magnetic force, we get an equation of the mass of the electron multiplied by the square of its velocity divided by the radius to equal the magnitude of the magnetic force multiplied by the charge of the electron and its velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field. We can cancel out the velocities, and when we rearrange the formula, the charge to mass ratio equals the velocity of the electron divided by the radius and the magnitude of the magnetic force. Thomson determined this value to be negative 1.76 times 10 to the 8 coulombs per gram. From this, Thomson created his own atomic model, which was an improvement on Dalton's billiard ball model. His model included these negatively charged electrons, which he concluded must be the particles associated with the basic structure of matter, the atom. Thomson's model of the atom consisted of a positively charged sphere in which the negative charges were embedded very much like raisins in a bun. Thomson's model became known as the raisin bun or plum pudding model of the atom.